um, session is on consciousness and psilocybin, and we have two very interesting talks on psilocybin mushrooms. And in fact, if you look under your seat, you'll find a little baggie with some mushrooms. That, no. <laughs> I wish. All right. <laughs> the first speaker is Catherine McLean from Johns Hopkins. She's a PhD in psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Uh, she studied at Dartmouth and she was at Davis. She's done a lot of very interesting work and she's got, oh, and let me just say that uh, the two speakers have asked that we hold um, questions uh, for the end unless uh, there's very specific technical questions after uh, Catherine's uh, uh, talk about about the methodology. So uh, she's going to speak on psilocybin and personality change. Let's welcome Catherine McLean. Hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm very excited to be here. I want to thank the organizers. And Robin just told me he actually saw into the future, and something amazing is going to happen today. So I'm so glad you all stayed for it. Uh, I always like to start off by thanking my mentors, the people who I feel like I'm representing when I talk about my research. Roland Griffiths at Hopkins was very courageous when he started this research back up about a decade ago, along with Bill Richards, who had been doing clinical work with psychedelics for a long time. Uh, Mary Casamano has been there since the beginning, Matt Johnson various others who have come through our study team at Hopkins, and also I'd like to thank my mentors uh, for being extreme skeptics and encouraging me to be very rigorous in trying to study consciousness, as well as all the funders. Hopefully we'll get some more uh, government funders in that list soon. Okay, so psychedelics are back. <laughs> uh, I'm sure some of you are wondering where they went and maybe <laughs> They didn't go anywhere. Um, I have the exclamation point there for a reason. No one really seems to feel very neutral about psychedelics. You either hate them or you love them, and I'm on neither extreme. I just think they're a really useful tool for studying brain function and consciousness and hopefully kind of trying to tie those two sides together. I also like to start with an overview so that then it's up to you how much you want to pay attention, but you can get everything that I'm about to talk about right here. So psychedelics cover a broad range of conscious experiences. There are many ways to study them. The focus that we've taken at Hopkins is looking at uh, this thing called a mystical experience or a spiritual experience. And this is kind of coming from their traditional use in indigenous cultures as a sacrament for spiritual purposes. And essentially what we found is that in healthy, well-prepared individuals who are spiritually inclined, psilocybin produces reliably a mystical or spiritual experience better than an active control drug and in a dose-related way. And not only does it produce these mystical experiences, but they have long-term positive effects on behaviors, attitudes, meaning, and interpersonal relationships more than a year after a single high-dose session. When I arrived at Hopkins about two and a half years ago, I was very interested in some of these domains uh, in psychology where we have really standard reliable measures, such as personality. And personality is something that people don't think really changes, although uh, more people are beginning to show that it can change. You just have to know when to measure it. And essentially found that only a particular domain of personality changed after the high dose psilocybin session, and that was called openness, so I'll talk more about that. And those, all, those increases also persisted more than a year after the session, suggesting some kind of permanent shift. And then I'll kind of end with some discussion of what this means for continued basic science research, therapeutic applications, and uh, I'll hopefully cover world peace too. Okay, so there are probably some of you in the audience who are much better experts at history and the history of psychedelic use than me. Kind of suffice it to say, there has been a long history of indigenous use of psilocybe mushrooms, which is the genus of mushrooms that, the, uh, that psilocybin is the psychoactive active component of. And kind of taking a broad anthropological perspective, it's probably more normal that these compounds were used for spiritual purposes, for consciousness exploration, and as tools for gaining knowledge about the world than it is our kind of current conception of them as these kind of weird drugs of abuse that 
um, that seem to cause problems for some people and seem to be life-changing for others. I've just included a couple images uh, suggesting that psilocybe mushrooms had a really important role in some of these indigenous cultures going back as, as far back as 8,000 BC. The, um, the picture kind of in the middle here, if you can see my cursor, this is called the, the bee man and I guess if you're looking for mushrooms in this picture you could kind of see that it looks like he's holding some and he's kind of adorned with them around his body. You could probably also think that those are other things as well. So the historical record isn't totally clear, but at least more recently in Central America, it is fairly clear that psilocybe mushrooms as well as other compounds were used for, uh, by shamans and in certain religious rituals. Of course, when the Spanish missionaries got to Mexico, uh, they, they documented the ritual use of psilocybin among the Aztec people and then promptly tried to totally erase any history, any use of, of, that, uh, of that compound by the indigenous folks. When Gordon Wasson and his wife Valentina went down to Mexico, they kind of rediscovered the mushrooms, but um, it was a, still a very underground practice and it had been kind of turned into this mix of Christian and traditional uh, religion. And so Gordon came back and published his account in Life magazine in 1957, which kind of began the scientific interest in psychedelics uh, in the West. There's a, been a kind of a brief burst of scientific research from the late 50s until about the early 70s in the US and other countries. And then after that brief burst that was really productive, essentially everything went dormant when the US and world drug laws decided to schedule LSD and other related compounds at the most strict level, which means there's no medical use and there's high, um, there's high risk. So essentially the research in the US went dormant there was still quite a lot of experimentation and clinical application that was essentially underground. And then in the 1990s, a few groups in Europe started, uh, started the research back up. But it wasn't until about 2000 when Roland Griffiths and others at Hopkins initiated the first US study in, in decades, which was a randomized placebo-controlled trial in healthy humans. And I'm not good with visuals, but this very simple visual helps me kind of put in perspective what we think is kind of the story of psychedelics, which is that little red blip at the end, and the entire history of possible use in indigenous cultures. And so it seems to me that we're, uh, we, again, we can, we can argue what then and now is. It's probably already all happened and it's happening, but uh, it's what our little kind of frame right here is this tiny little snapshot. And you know, I'm, I'm excited that it's, the research is starting up again. Uh, who knows what it will hold in the future, but it seems, uh, it seems very premature to make any decisions about what these tools can do for science, uh, just looking at the last 50 years or so. In terms of terminology, hallucinogen is actually a pretty bad word for these compounds. It refers to kind of frank hallucinations of things that aren't, quote, really out there in the real world. And psychedelics often don't produce frank hallucinations. There's another word, psychotomimetic. Uh, that has actually produced a lot of really good, that kind of framework has produced quite a bit of really good research, but it implies that whatever happens to consciousness is inherently uh, dangerous and maladaptive. In, indeed, it mimics psychosis. Then you can see that there are a couple other terms. The last term, entheogen, is a fairly new term. And it's also not a great term, but it seems to capture this inherent quality that a lot of people experience on psychedelics, which is that it seems to have a divine or sacred nature. And that can be apart from whether you're religious or spiritual, but uh, essentially kind of a feeling that this is more important, more meaningful, of more purpose than your normal, ordinary reality. So it's that kind of from that entheogenic perspective that uh, that the research at Hopkins got started and we were curious to know whether psilocybin actually produces spiritual experiences when you control for all the other possible factors that could lead to such an experience. So this is more than just the biochemical action of psilocybin. Set and setting, which is uh, probably the best uh, legacy of Timothy Leary, creating that kind of sense that 
your particular expectations and then the context in which you use the compounds really matters. It matters for every, every drug that you might study. Psychopharmacologists have known this for a really long time, but it seems to matter in particular for psychedelics. And so if you create a ritualistic context and the person is expecting a spiritual experience and wants to be healed by these compounds, you're probably going to create more, a, a stronger likelihood of a spiritual experience. And this is our version of set and setting. You could, this room looks exactly the same now as it did 10 years ago. We kind of took a little bit of a different approach. Uh, there was some work done in the early clinical work with psychedelics in Canada where they decided that it actually really mattered the room that the, the person was in, even if their eyes were closed most of the time, but that it was essentially safe and pleasing and that there was art and kind of, you can see there's some religious iconography and statues. Um, but the idea was to create a setting that would be uh, more likely to produce a spiritual experience. There's, I mean, we don't make any claims that, um, that the setting doesn't matter. We, in fact, think it matters quite a bit. Uh, and I'll explain why we can kind of tease apart the setting from the actual drug effect uh, in just a second. Okay, so the the two studies that have been done in healthy volunteers over the last uh, over the last decade, the first study was essentially for those of you who know the Good Friday experiment, Wal Walter Pankey and others at Harvard gave psilocybin to half of a group of theology students on Good Friday in the Marsh Chapel and half got an active control drug. Everyone took the, the drugs together, so it wasn't really blind in that once the psilocybin effects kicked in, everyone knew who had gotten the drug and who hadn't. But he did show that psilocybin was capable of producing these mystical experiences that were no different than authentic spiritual experiences that have been documented across all religious uh, traditions. So, Roland and, and Bill Richards and the group at Hopkins at the time thought, well, let's just see if psilocybin is better than an active control drug at producing these mystical experiences. And the second study was building off of that study, looking at whether the mystical type effects of psilocybin increased in a dose-dependent way. You could imagine that if you have no effect, versus some effect, well, the some effect might just produce the spiritual experience. And they were curious to know how closely it was related to the actual amount of psilocybin uh, that the volunteers received. So let me talk just briefly about what a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized design means. It means that when you show up for your session, Neither you nor the people in the room know anything about the study design, how much psilocybin you're going to get, what kind of drug you're going to get, and it's possible that you'll get nothing. Randomized means that even if there are some doses that are promised to be given at some point, you don't know in what order they'll be given. And this is actually essential in psychopharmacology because um, I guide volunteers through sessions and I have expectations. If I knew what dose they were getting or what the general study design was, I could easily influence the results that they report. And same, of course, from the volunteer's perspective. So in the first study, there were 36 healthy adults from the Baltimore, D.C. area, all spiritually inclined. We can talk more about the participant sample. It's pretty homogeneous. The high dose of psilocybin was actually 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram, which is uh, a very hefty recreational dose and all of these people had never taken a hallucinogen before in their life. The control drug was Ritalin, and it turns out that Ritalin, at a high enough dose, is actually pretty good at mimicking some of the physiological and positive mood effects of psilocybin. In the second study, 18 healthy adults uh, participated in five sessions across about six months, one month apart and they were promised to get a high dose of psilocybin, same high dose, 30 milligrams at some point, but there could be other doses that were administered, anywhere from nothing, zero total placebo, to up to 30. Half of the volunteers received an ascending dose and half received a descending, meaning that the volunteers who received ascending could have started with a placebo or five milligrams and then built up and the other half could have started with 30 and then went down. Okay, so I wanted to share, there's, uh, I know that uh, 
volunteers' words can speak a lot better about these experiences than uh, necessarily our measures. So I wanted to share the story of a volunteer that I actually had the, the pleasure of working with in the study that we've been doing over the last couple of years at Hopkins. And what I want to emphasize from the start is this, this person is an extremely normal person, much more normal than anyone here. So <laughs> he was certainly open-minded, interested in exploring his spirituality, but not necessarily the kind of person who might just kind of make up effects or really exaggerate what was going on. He's a young man about in his kind of early to mid-30s. He had a wife, uh, very, you know, kind of classic American upbringing, well-educated, um, but really, really average in most respects. So anyway, this is his, uh, this is his narrative about his first, uh, his first session. In my mind's eye, I felt myself instinctively taking on the posture of prayer in my head. I was on my knees, hands clasped in front of me, and I bowed to this force. I wasn't scared or threatened in any way. It was more about reverence. I was showing my respect. I was humbled and honored to be in this presence. This presence was a feeling, not something I saw or heard. I only felt it, but it felt more real than any reality I've experienced. And it was a familiar place, too, one I had felt before. It was when I surrendered to this that I felt like I let go. I was gone, or should I say this earthly part of me was. It was still on the couch in some sort of suspended animation awaiting my return. I was in the void. This void had a strange and indescribable quality to it that there was nothing to it but this feeling of unconditional and undying love. It felt like my soul was basking in this feeling of this space. I have no idea how long this lasted. Time and space did not exist there, and there was no way of tracking it. I would have thought the music might remind me of the time, but at the point I felt like I was the music, or the music was me, or maybe that it was all different manifestations of this love feeling I found myself wrapped in. Sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I chose to read that little section of his story because I think it helps me introduce how we quantify mystical experience. There are many ways you could quantify it, measure it, many variations of mystical experience. We're going from William Stace kind of identifying certain core features of mystical experience across different biographical accounts, letters, journal, uh, kind of personal diaries, that sort of thing. The primary feature is this idea of unity or interconnectedness. And this could mean unity with God if you believe in God. It could be unity with the universe. It could be unity with yourself uh, or even your surroundings. The other features that are present in these experiences, according to Stace and our results seem to hold this up, are a sense of sacredness or reverence, a noetic quality. So you notice the volunteer talked about having a sense that it was as real or more real than waking life, um, that there was an intuitive knowledge that there's some kind of truth value to the experience, positive mood, uh, transcending time and space, and ineffability. Ineffability is kind of an alleged quality. Some people will claim that they can really describe these experiences and other people not so much. So taking all these features that Stace defined, there are two questionnaire measures that pretty well capture these features. One is the Hood Mysticism Scale, which is usually used to, qual uh, to quantify lifetime experiences, so across your whole life. And the Mystical Experience Questionnaire, which was developed by the, the lead author of the Good Friday Experiment, uh, that was specifically for a single uh, drug or other type of uh, intervention session. Okay, so all of that, and we get these kind of boring graphs, but <laughs> basically what this shows, this is from the second study. Um, this shows, so this is, if you see on the y-axis, this is, this is mystical score, so higher means more mystical. And you can see that at placebo, um, we do a pretty good job of helping people feel like they're already in this mystical space to begin with. And then this is actually sub-threshold, a little bit stronger, and then you see this bump up at 20 and 30. The hood scale is actually less sensitive to um, these immediate effects than the mystical experience questionnaire. You can see this really nice increase across dose in mystical score. And remember, these people don't know what dose they're getting. So they're making these ratings after the, right after the session. No one knows what dose they got, and you still get this really nice increase across very small amount difference in actual uh, psilocybin. In the first study, 60% of volunteers at the high dose achieved what we call a complete mystical experience, which is a somewhat silly way of dichotomizing it, but it just means that basically all of those features are present to some 
uh, to some level, to some degree. And in the second study, we actually, it was a, we did a better job, probably because 30 is a little bit overwhelming for some people. So more people had mystical experiences at the moderately high dose and not at the highest dose. But still, 60 to 70 percent is a pretty good number. And for those of you who are a little skeptical, it's not 100 percent, meaning that we're not, we're not fully capable of producing the mystical experience just because we want it to be there and because the volunteers want it to be there. The mystical experiences predict uh, ratings that people made 14 months later. So all of these graphs at the top just show that um, this is, for example, spirit, uh, spiritually significant experiences, positive behavior change, personal well-being, methylphenidate, there's, I mean, it's elevated, but it's a pretty low, uh, it's a pretty low score. And two months after the psilocybin in yellow, and then 14 months again, the ratings are essentially unchanged, meaning how you felt two months after the session is essentially how you continue to feel more than a year later. And these people were spiritually inclined volunteers. They were not leading these spiritually impo impoverished lives. They had a strong sangha or community to go back to. They continued to explore their spirituality, and they were still looking back on this experience, saying it was among the top, most meaningful, spiritually significant experiences of my life, and it has changed my life for the better. And the, the bottom graph is just showing that mystical experience score predicts these ratings a year later, and overall intensity does not. I'll kind of go through this quickly. We did a, uh, just to help you believe that maybe this isn't just a magical product of Hopkins, 1,600 people in about two months responded to a survey I posted and it was an anonymous survey, and we essentially replicated all of our lab results. And the, the degree of enthusiasm that people had to respond about profound psilocybin experiences and the reliability of the data suggests that what we're measuring the, in the lab is actually a real phenomenon out there in the world. And the unity, sacred, sacredness, and positive mood seem to predict long-term effects better than some of the other factors. Okay, so personality. Personality is the kind of the thing about you that doesn't really change, that you feel makes you who you are. In psychology, this has been one of the most well-studied constructs over the last 50 years. Cross-culturally, we see that there are certain domains of personality that seem to be the same. So you have neuroticism, which is kind of being tense, anxious, moody, impulsive, extroversion, self-explanatory, agreeableness, how well you get along with others and cooperate, openness, and then I'll talk more about openness, and conscientiousness, if you follow rules and plan and are kind of organized. So those five factors are there across your lifetime. You can be high and low in different ones. It's heritable, so about 50% of personality is genetic, and it's relatively stable after age 30. There's a gold standard measure of personality called the Neo Personality Inventory. There are 240 items that you either agree with or disagree with, and that gets at these five factors and the kind of sub-facets of each factor which get at more specific traits. There's some anecdotal and subjective claims that psilocybin can change personality, but not much objective evidence. So the McLaughlin study back in 67 showed that LSD produced some short-term changes on measures of creativity and artistic ability, uh, but they were basically gone after six months. And importantly, we actually didn't have a good way of measuring personality that everyone agreed on when the hallucinogen research was stopped in the late 60s. And now we do, we have the NEO. And you can argue if the NEO is the best, but it, there's actually a strong consensus around the NEO as being a really good measure of personality now in social psychology. So there's one domain of, of, uh, of personality that seems to fit best with the anecdotal claims from psychedelics, which is kind of openness, open-mindedness. I like this quote. You can read it as I talk about the different facets. Um, they're kind of, you can imagine openness as being imaginative, interested in problem solving, abstract ideas, interest in art and music, openness to your own and others' feelings. Uh, there's a little bit of a controversial piece where it predicts uh, socially conservative versus liberal tendencies as well as uh, what kind of uh, actions or behaviors you're likely to engage in. Again, this fits with the subjective claims of hallucinogens in, um, in early studies and currently. So a lot, a lot of times people will go through these laboratory experiments and then claim certain changes in the long run that seem to fit with the domain of openness. And there's some cross-sectional evidence that hallucinogen users versus other drug users value things like openness in their life, but the cross-sectional thing is a little bit hard to interpret. 
So what I decided to do is look at longitudinal change in openness from before to after the session and then again 14 months later. And I combined across the two studies to get more power to see if there was any real effect. And essentially what you see, it doesn't, you know, it's not that impressive when you look at it this way, but from screening until after psilocybin, one to two months after the session, after the high dose session, you see a significant increase. And this looks like a tiny effect, but actually openness and the other domains are not supposed to change at all. So there's something going on there that seems to be reliable. Moreover, it seemed that the amount of change in openness was predicted by how strong your mystical experience was on the session day. So you have openness change along the y-axis and mystical experience. So this guy up here or this lady, they really won the golden ticket in our study. Uh, this amount of change in personality is, I mean, it's almost unbelievable. And you can see that it's kind of cor it's correlated with the strength of the mystical experience. And these folks down here, didn't really have a strong mystical experience for whatever reason and their personality didn't change, their openness didn't increase. We had some other fancy statistical ways of showing that this wasn't just a correlation that actually mystical score seemed to predict openness better than some of the other measures we had. And you can also look at it this way, you can split up the people into those who had a complete mystical experience, which is a little bit more than half, and those who didn't. And you can see, if you look at the, uh, the white circles, the people who didn't are staying really stable. So they look like the population, not changing. And the people who had a complete mystical experience are increasing. More surprisingly to me was that these increases were still there 14 months later. So this means, I mean, I think this really shook up the personality world because it means that a single session, obviously with a certain clinical approach, a lot of preparation, safe environment, all of that, but a single session with a drug changed personality more than anything else that has been shown really in the whole literature of personality. And it was still there 14 months later. We can talk a little bit about where the people started to begin with. They're already pretty high in openness, but I think that helps our, uh, the believability of our results because there's less room for them to go up. Um, I'll go this, through this a little bit quickly, but the overall impression you should get here is that the increases were there for all of the different facets. So people were increasing on all the different domains of openness. It wasn't just like one of, so fantasy, you can imagine that one would be fairly obvious to increase fantasy imagination. It, that wasn't just the one driving all of the effects. You can read some of the items to give you an idea. So aesthetics, I'm intrigued by patterns I find in art and nature. I enjoy playing with theories or abstract ideas. You, may, you might be getting the sense that everyone here is probably maxing out on openness, so I don't know if psilocybin would really be able to touch that, but. Okay, for future directions, we wanna look at what aspects or factors of the mystical experience are most predictive of changes in personality, and we've been doing some kind of boring factor analysis of our questionnaires to kind of get at what might be the best uh, predictive piece of the way we're trying to measure the experience. It might not be mystical experience the way we've been conceptualizing it. There's a lot of really nice work done uh, in recent years on self-transcendence, the benefits of being selfless, mostly from uh, Mathieu, the first citation is Mathieu Ricard, so kind of from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of training, um, and some other work showing that distance from self can actually increase wisdom and adaptive psychological behaviors. It's possible that uh, the Hopkins group is really good at producing mystical experiences and increases in openness. So in, in kind of a best case scenario, I'd like to do a full year-long study where some of the people never get a high dose of psilocybin, but, but we track their personality over a long period of time to see if just interacting with us and exposing them to new ideas can cause the bump. And of course, we'd like to get to objective measures of openness. So what do I mean by objective measures? There was a great, uh, really interesting early study by uh, Jim Fadiman and colleagues at Stanford where they gave low doses of LSD to engineers and scientists who were stuck on an important problem. And they wanted to see if it helped them solve the problem. The problem is, the problem is that they, uh, they didn't really have a good outcome measure for what it meant to solve this really intractable problem that was only interesting to a small set of engineers or scientists. 
Now we have better measures of creativity and problem solving in the laboratory and a better understanding of the neural correlates of creativity. So it seems pretty obvious to me that we could easily take our findings and look at objective measures of problem solving and creativity in the lab. There's another set of research from social psychology looking at qualities like curiosity, being inspired, feeling inspired, predicting things like how many patents people hold. This is all research done in the US. Um, the inspiration work is done by Todd Thrash and colleagues. And these things, these kind of uh, pieces of psychology might be related to openness. And finally, for those of you who are impressed by actual numbers, there was a recent study, an economic study, that showed that uh, one standard deviation increase in openness was equivalent to an increase in $60,000 of annual income. Some of the other personality factors apparently cost more, so if you decrease your neuroticism, it's something like $300,000 annual income. Uh, there's some other work showing that intellectual curiosity, which is one of the facets of openness, combined with effort, is as good at predicting academic and work achievement as IQ. So I see psilocybin as potentially not just a therapeutic application, but an application to making kind of the socioeconomic education sphere more fair, that you're giving people a chance to actually gain traits that they weren't born with. There are a bunch of clinical applications. I think Robin's going to talk a little bit more about that. Increases in openness could obviously help in, in, uh, in disorders that involve depression, anxiety, rigid thinking, um, low serotonergic function. So I left out all of the biochemical stuff because Robin's going to take care of that in a really elegant way in, in just a little bit. But basically, the thing that psilocybin acts on could have therapeutic applications across the board in a lot of psychiatric disorders. Before you get too excited, the other thing that we're all probably a little high in here is some of the magical thinking and you know loss of boundaries stuff going on. Increases in openness are not always good. They're correlated with schizotypy, which is um, you can function pretty well with it, but you can also run into problems in your life, depending on the context you find yourself in. Mania and other kind of negative implications of, do you want to change who you are? Um, and these are kind of open questions. OK, one, uh, one more story from uh, our friend who had the mystical experience. Uh, we're doing a study now that combines daily meditation with psilocybin sessions in healthy volunteers. And this person had received about a month, month and a half of meditation instruction before their first session. And it, he was only meditating maybe about 10 or 15 minutes a day every morning. I was actually the person teaching him the meditation so I can talk to you more about what kind of instruction I gave, which could really affect how people react to the sessions. But essentially, this is what he said. This was in the same session I read from before, but later on in the day when the effects of psilocybin were kind of starting to wear off. He said, I remembered the instructions about how the mind will come up with all kinds of ways to distract you, to keep you in your body. And once I acknowledged that, I felt myself relaxing a bit. I focused on my breath and pulled in what I had learned from meditation over the last month and a half. And I felt myself going deeper and deeper. I started to feel a pleasing warmth at the base of my spine, and soon it was encompassing my whole body. It was tremendously relaxing and peaceful, pure bliss. I have no idea how long this lasted as I again found myself outside myself and held in the moment. All time seemed the same. There was no distinction between past, present, and future. It was all now. The way I kind of see what psilocybin can possibly give to meditation and vice versa is I've seen a lot of people struggle through many years of meditation and kind of beat themselves up, and, and they kind of run into all sorts of obstacles. You can argue whether those obstacles are necessary, that you have to learn some kind of discipline. Um, but I think it can be a little bit easier than that. And I think that uh, in the end, no one's really keeping track. There are no shortcuts. And psilocybin, if it can help people learn what it feels like to what I call embodying the present moment, I think that that can only be helpful, again, with the right teacher and a little bit of kind of a reality check once in a while. So I like, really like this quote from, uh, from Eric Weiner. He said that meditation can teach you to pause just long enough to realize that life, your life is a freaking miracle. And the least you can do is pay attention. And 
Meditation can teach you that over a long period of time, but I think that psilocybin can give people a glimpse into how the present moment feels, the now, and how it can also be very peaceful and accepting. Psilocybin can also pretty quickly bring people into, con into confrontation with their own pain and fear and discomfort in a way that you might learn through meditation over a gradual period of time, but um, I think it can kind of, kind of shake up the experience to show you that your mind is constantly projecting and you can still observe despite all of the chaos. And finally, I've, begin, I've begun to think a little bit more about how how psilocybin might be like meditation. At first glance, you know, it doesn't really improve your concentration in any way. It doesn't teach you mindfulness uh, directly. But there are kind of other aspects, and I go to the Theravada and Buddhism tradition because, well, they're really practical. And if the practical folks talk about things like energy, rapture, tranquility, and equanimity, then I think that they're probably uh, trustworthy. And I think that there are some parallels here between what people experience on psilocybin and certain uh, experiences that can come about through very long-term meditation practice. Again, giving people a glimpse into what meditation not necessarily will lead you to, but the things that you might uncover there that are coming from your own mind. I think a possible convergence between psilocybin and meditation also might be this increase in vividness and clarity of perception. And I can talk more about that afterward. It's a little bit, I think I'm the only person really thinking along these lines in terms of really basic perception and how that might relate to openness. I've done a, uh, quite a bit of work with long-term meditation training and showing changes in visual perception uh, with really boring tasks like these line stimuli you see up here. But I think at some level, these really low-level perceptual changes do impact this really high-level feeling of, of openness and, and well-being. And there's some interesting ways that we could kind of look at that scientifically in terms of novelty detection and interpersonal sensitivity, detecting emotions in yourself and others. OK, I'm already over time, but time doesn't exist, right? So, OK, uh, I'm, I'm actually so excited that I got to spend an entire week here before giving this talk, because uh, I know <laughs> I embarrassingly know nothing about philosophy. I, know, I knew very little about a lot of the topics covered here, so I kind of got this really quick introduction. But I was intrigued by this idea of there being a gap between science and biology and material world, the objective side and the subjective consciousness, spirituality, metaphysical side. And it's true that that gap is not going to go away, I don't think. But I do think that we've been missing a really important tool in this whole enterprise for the last 40, 50 years. And I don't want to make any strong claims. I don't want anyone to kind of freak out when I, when I show this. But I do think that this psilocybin molecule and other molecules like it can really form a bridge between microscopic level biology and the, full, the fullest you know, conscious experience you could have as a human being. Um, again, just as an important tool that we've really been missing that we're not going to make much progress, I don't think, unless we tackle that as one aspect of the science of consciousness. Um, I'm so excited for you guys to see Robin's talk. He has so much about the brain and serotonin and microscopic level. And I'd just like to leave you with a little uh, literary quote from George Saunders. Uh, he's talking about the default mode. And I'd like you to think about what your default mode is. He says, there's an ambient mode in which the mind sits idling before there is information. Some minds idle in a kind of dreading crouch, waiting to be offended. Others stand up straight, eyes slightly wide, expecting to be pleasantly surprised. Some minds, imagining the great what is out there, imagine it intends doom for them. Others imagine there is something out there that may be suffering and in need of help. Which is right? Neither. Both. So thank you. So just uh, a question about methodology, because we're going to save the questions for the end. Sue. Sue. Thank you. A question about your randomization of doses. Um, if I've understood it rightly, they always got the doses in either ascending or descending order. So at the very least, in the middle session, they'd know they'd got a middle dose, which seems to me to get rid of the blind 
that you, you claim it's blind, but it oh, isn't right. in that respect. Uh, yeah, so neither the guides nor the volunteers knew it was ascending and descending. So oh, that, okay. yeah, so that, sorry, I left that part out. So that whole part of the, the design was also blind to them. Uh, the number okay. yeah, of actually, you did kind of say that, and I didn't twig it by, by saying that all of those aspects they were blinded to. Yeah, and okay. even the Thank study you. that I'm doing now, I have no idea at all what the hypotheses are. I don't even know what range of doses. I know that they are getting psilocybin at some point. That's it. <laughs> so who's, in, who's so determining that? Roland Griffiths and Matt Johnson are the ones who designed the study, and they have very little interaction with the volunteers compared to me and some of the other clinical folks. Thank you. Let's have one from uh, Barrett, and then uh, we'll move on. We'll save the rest for the end. We'll have time for. And I'll be around all afternoon. So will Robin. So we can answer hundreds of questions. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> I like to talk a lot. Um, I have a, uh, a question about the study design. So um, I, you didn't mention a placebo. You mentioned an active comparator, uh, the, the Ritalin. Yeah. Um, and so I was wondering whether uh, there was actually a placebo involved or just the active comparator, and also whether in the long longitudinal study, whether you were following up on uh, if there was a placebo, if you were following up on those, and if you were following up on the group that was on the active comparator. Okay, so the short so uh, the short answer is in the first study there was no uh, straight up placebo; it was only psilocybin and methylphenidate. But they were actually told they could receive uh, up to 17 different drugs that none of which they had experience with. So in their, in their experience, it could, have, it could have felt like nothing possibly. They didn't know that they wouldn't get a true placebo. In the second study, there was a true placebo as well as five milligrams, which is subthreshold for a lot of folks. Um, and the short-term changes, so one or two months after the session, were still fully blind and controlled. The problem at the 14-month time point is that at that point, everyone's gotten psilocybin. Uh, so you can't really show that the really long-term change isn't due to some kind of expectation, which I would love to replicate in another study where it involves being a little bit patient because people have to wait a whole year before they possibly get anything worthwhile. Okay, let's hold the rest uh, for general discussion. Thank Dr. Catherine McLean for a great talk.